Welcome to CivilNet. I have a very special guest here in our studio. He is a, a prominent international humanitarian rights lawyer. He is currently the senior legal advisor at the International Law and Policy Institute in Oslo, Norway, Nobuo Hayashi. Mr. Hayashi, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is your, your first time in Armenia. It is correct. Uh, at the invitation of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Yes, the Yerevan delegation. The Yerevan delegation of the ICRC here in Armenia. Um, you will be giving a lecture at the American University of Armenia uh, that's entitled Law and Morals on the Failure of an Able Bystander to Protect Victims of Genocide. Can you please define for us what you mean by a bystander? Yes, of course. Uh, there is no definition, let's say, of who a bystander is. But to me, a bystander is someone who is neither the victim nor the perpetrator, mm -hmm. nor, let's say, those. Uh, or let me correct that. Let me correct myself. Anyone who is neither a victim nor uh, involved in the commission of the crime is essentially a bystander. So if we were to take uh, a genocide in recent memory, because unfortunately we have several examples of that, yes. um, Rwanda, for example, right. uh, would the UK embassy mm -hmm. be a bystander? International. I would definitely one. think yeah. yes. The UK. I, I mean, no. I just gave UK as no, an arbitrary sort of thing. It could be any embassy. Uh, for example, those uh, members of the Hutu ethnicity mm. who were in no way involved in the commission of the genocide, for example, against the Tutsis, mm. could also be bystanders, mm. international observers, expats, journalists, journalists, um, peacekeepers. For example, they could all be bystanders. And what are the legal consequences of being a bystander? That's a good question. Um, the potential legal consequences, because there is not always a legal consequence sure. of being a bystander. Okay. But a potential legal consequence of a bystander is that he or she may uh, become criminally liable for either being complicit in genocide or sort of ending up being an aider and a better mm -hmm. in genocide, depending on the combination of his or her uh, state of mind plus the nature of uh, his or her failure to assist or to protect, if you like. Okay, you know, I don't want to get too deep into this, but I know one question leads to another. Of course. What about uh, the UN peacekeeping mission in Rwanda when they couldn't prevent it and they stood by if well, they did stand? No, yeah, I mean, I, fact, I know it was a Canadian, Romeo Dallaire was the you know, head of the delegation of the peacekeeping mission there, but I'm not suggesting they didn't do that, I'm just curious. Yes, for example, um, he would be one of the most, one of the less problematic bystanders. He kind of stuck around at least, mm -hmm. despite his limited resources mm -hmm. and mandate. In the Rwandan episode, the Belgian peacekeepers, for example, would be a more interesting, excuse my sort of uh, inappropriate language, but uh, a more pertinent mm -hmm. group of bystanders. Their job was, in fact, to protect uh, the civilian population at the time, but they had I think it was 12 Belgian peacekeepers, in fact, killed by the militia as well. So their standing becomes a lot more complicated than just somebody who is unable to do as much as he or she would like to do. In fact, their life is kind of in danger. Mm -hmm. And yet there is this mandate to, to extend protection. So that's a more kind of a complex mm -hmm. Uh, situation of a bystander. Yeah, but it's very fascinating. Can we go back a century now, mm -hmm. if yes, we may, uh, to the Armenian Genocide? Mm -hmm. um, the term genocide was coined by Raphael Lemkin in 1948, yes. uh, and you as an um, international lawyer mm -hmm. uh, would probably say that it's not retroactive, because the term was coined 
Yes. 30 years after the, the, the case itself. Yes. But nonetheless, uh, the Armenian people still demand justice. Mm -hmm. They still demand recognition from Turkey. And yes. this year came to show that um, we've become quite uh, vocal in terms of reparations mm -hmm. and restitution. Now, if we were talking about bystanders, and uh, I certainly don't know if you're an expert on the Armenian genocide, so you know, for our viewers to know that you know, I'm making assumptions here, perhaps, as, as, as somebody asking you the question. Mm -hmm. If, for example, Turkey was to recognize the Armenian genocide, and I don't know what international body, uh, would it be the United Nations, or whoever it would be to, you know, some kind of negotiation between the Armenian state and Turkey uh, for any kind of compensation. Bystanders, there were many, many who were complicit, who are very strong, powerful nations today. Are there any legal responsibilities there? Let's say in the case of Germany, for example. The responsibility would or could be engaged if something a little more than just standing idle. I'm talking about being a little bit more complicit than standing idly by. Uh, for example, complicity, complicity would require two things. One is some sort of, uh, we call it uh, uh, assistance. So whatever you do ends up assisting in the commission of the crime. Whatever you do may also take the form of an omission. Mm. So that's the tricky part. But then, essentially what you're trying to establish is the causal link, tenuous as it, as it may be, between what you choose to do as a bystander and what happens as a result of your uh, action, behavior. The second thing you need, to do, you need to establish is that you had certain state of mind. For complicity, you don't have to have the to share the intent of the crime. You don't you don't have to intend to commit the crime, but you do need to have the awareness that the crime is being committed. Some people have difficulty reconciling this idea with genocide, because genocide is, as you know, a, a, a crime of uh, specific intent or special intent. Mm -hmm. So how would you know that your counterpart mm -hmm. has this special intent himself or herself? I think it's possible to argue that if you have reasonable, uh, you have good reasons to suspect that genocide might be taking place, that would constitute the requ requisite knowledge. So for Germany to be uh, held responsible for complicity in the Armenian genocide, you need to establish these two things. I think. You know, this is uh, extremely fascinating for me and uh, we can talk about this endlessly, but now let's switch, if we may, to international humanitarian law. Yes. Several months ago, uh, we had in our studio Dr. Marco Sassoli, who is another expert in, in, in IH, IHL. Yes. Uh, and my first question to him, and I want to ask it again today, mm -hmm. because I think these are terms that uh, for us in Armenia are important that we understand. Yes. The difference between international humanitarian law and human rights law. Mm -hmm. Um, from what I recall from in that interview, uh, is that one is uh, during times of war and conflict, which is IHL, and the rest is uh, and human rights laws for humanity in everyday life. Yes. Where other places do these two laws intersect? Let me add my own take. Sure, please. Of the, yeah. uh, the, the difference or the two bodies of law, uh, first of all. And that is, international humanitarian law is essentially a body of law that deals with the way in which two belligerent parties fight. It's a bit like rules of boxing. Mm -hmm. You can hit with your fist, but you can't kick. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, you're talking about kickboxing. Sure. Um, so, but the assumption is that you can do certain harm vis-a-vis -vis the other, mm -hmm. but there are boundaries. And protecting civilians, for example, mm -hmm. is one of those rules that sets out the boundary mm -hmm. of permissible inter-party violence. Whereas human rights law 
is a, a, has a, something a little constitutional about it. That is to say that international human rights law is fundamentally about restraining the exercise of public power. Mm -hmm. So you have individuals who are subject to power and authority by their government. And international human, human rights law is there to restrain the exercise of power by that government vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis its citizens. So the idea is not, for example, uh, any sort of um, uh, inter-party violence. There is no reciprocity uh, expected between the citizen and the government. Mm -hmm. The government is required to restrain its power simply because human rights law is there to protect the citizens. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a r real philosophical difference between sure, the two. Sure, sure, sure. It's, it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, again, it's still relevant. This question that keeps uh, popping up into my head is about non-state actors uh, and IHL. Yes. If we look at the Islamic State, for example, um, if you read the news, it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. uh, um, sometimes I'm not even sure if the images I'm seeing are real or not because they are so horrific that it's unbelievable as a human being that this is happening in the 21st century. How does IHL bind, restrict, oversee, regulate no the actions of non-state actors like the IS today? I know there, is, uh, there has been some doctrinal debate amongst international humanitarian lawyers as to whether the law binds the non-state entity. And there are a number of theories uh, put forward. Uh, to be honest, I'm not convinced by any of them. But I'm not going to bore you with the details of these theories. But I would like to suggest one very simple solution to the question as to whether IHL binds non-state entities. The answer is yes, it does. But the reason is uh, not what you may expect. Many, including Dr. Sassoli, for example, mm -hmm. have uh, proposed the idea that um, there might be an element of consent on the part of the non-state entity. Mm -hmm. We have to give non-state entities a sense of ownership so that they feel bound by it. Mm -hmm. the, the something, there is something in it for them. Uh, I'm not sure if it's that's necessary for us to say that IHL binds them. When international human rights law was written, it was written by states. And there are rules in human rights law that bind us, individuals. When were we consulted about whether we wish to be bound by human rights law? D did we want this or that right given to us? The fact that the law regulates our behavior mm -hmm. comes not from the fact that we have consented to it, mm -hmm. but it's in the nature of international law that states simply decide that the law shall apply to them or to other, other people. So as, soon as, as long as international humanitarian law is intended to bind states as well as non-state entities, I think that's the end of the story. But it's one thing to say that international humanitarian law binds non-state entities, which is kind of a subject of primary concern to lawyers. But that's, of course, not much of a help when the non-state entity, technically bound by international humanitarian law, doesn't behave according sure. to, to the law. Well, because a state may not also not behave as either. well. Yes. Right. So they exist. Uh, one final question. The Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh is considered a non-state entity. By the majority of... By the majority of the world. Yes. Um, in this case, if IHL, if NKR, the N Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh, mm -hmm. is bound by IHL, mm -hmm. if it has the institutions of democracy, it has a parliament, a constitution, it has all the trappings of statehood, mm -hmm yet it is a non-state actor because it is unrecognized by the vast majority of the world. Mm -hmm. Who decides that it is a state or a, a non-state? There is no central authority in international law that can give you the answer. Uh, let me give you a very controversial example. 
the vast majority of the world considers uh, the settlement activities in the West Bank by Israel in breach of the Geneva Conventions, the fourth Geneva Convention to be more precise. And that's because the West Bank is occupied and so on. Everybody says it, even the State Department of the United States says it, but that doesn't affect what Israel considers itself uh, is the rule on the matter. The fact is that unless you have submitted voluntarily to uh, a compulsory jurisdiction, a court that sits on top of your head, no one can force you to agree to a view of international uh, obligations, other than yourself. Mm -hmm. So if Armenia, for example, decides that Nagorno-Karabakh is a state, the rest of the world can say otherwise. But that doesn't bind Armenia, in its opinion, mm -hmm. that Nagorno-Karabakh is a state. Likewise, the mere fact that Armenia insists that Nagorno-Karabakh is a state doesn't bind in anybody else. Certainly. But what about the international law of the rights to people's self-determination? There is a um, separate matter mm -hmm. of treating an entity as a state. It may be a state, but for example, there were some interesting entities coming out uh, in different parts of the world. Northern Cyprus is one. Uh, another one that used to exist is the uh, Bantustans in South, uh, apartheid South Africa. Apartheid, apartheid South Africa created those trans sky and state, they essentially expelled all the uh, African, African residents there and created a state. Mm -hmm. the, there is a, an obligation of international law according to which states shall withhold recognition of a situation which involves great violations of international law. Mm -hmm. Apartheid is a great violation of international law. Hence, the entity that has come out as a result of a violation uh, should not be recognized. It's, it, it should not be legitimized with recognition. So states have a duty not to recognize uh, such situations as lawful. So if, let's say, entities like Nagorno-Karabakh, their emergence or, and their claim to statehood hypothetically involves violations, violations. of important rules like self-determination, then that would create an obligation on the part of the, the other states to withhold recognition. Right, but it didn't violate self-determination. It invoked self-determination. Right. right. Uh, I mean, like everything, it, there's no black and white. I mean, there's everything is uh, really left up to legal interpretation, Very much. Uh, politics, always. Uh, Lawyers have a good answer to all of that, and, it, and that is, it depends. It depends. That's, that's how we yeah. Uh, yeah. answer the questions. Well, Mr. Hayashi, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for this illuminating conversation. Uh, we spoke not only about IHL, but we spoke about many other things. Uh, I course. hope that for our viewers it was very informative and educational, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'd like to remind our viewers that my guest was international humanitarian law expert Nobuo Hayashi.